Thank you, Bob. It's good to be back. It always is good to be here. I, I think that uh, most of you remember that uh, we were here in late February, and uh, Beth and I had just come back from Bahrain, and um, I accepted a new position with the RCA. I'm now the coordinator for prayer mobilization uh, at the national level. It's a brand new position. It's a half-time position. And um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the area of mobilizing prayer. Uh, but it is always a joy for Beth and me to be back here in Hopkins and to see friends that we've known a long time and frankly, a lot of new faces uh, as well. So um, thanks for the warm introduction. Now, for those of you who know me well, you know I'm an outline kind of preacher, teacher. And in your bulletin, there is an outline. And I want to encourage you to get that out. And get out a pen and take some notes. Because it's true that if you take notes on a message, you remember more. And you, you're more engaged with God's word. I've entitled the message today, Lord, teach us to pray. I think it's very interesting that if you look through the scriptures, you never find anywhere in the Gospels where the disciples are ever asking the Lord, Lord, teach us to preach. Lord, teach us to teach. Lord, teach us to serve. But he does, we find this place, Lord, teach us to pray. A little later on, we're going to find out why that is. Uh, it's based on the scripture passage, Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. And um, something I've always asked from every congregation where I've had the joy and privilege to serve is, would you please stand in honor of God's word? And if it is difficult for you to do that, feel free to remain in your seat. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And Jesus said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Please be seated. Last February, I preached a message called PUSH, which is an acronym for Pray Until Something Happens. It was a, me a message that reminded us that sometimes we'll only be able to attain what we need by persevering in our praying. Keep praying until we see a clear answer. This morning, I want to take a step back and consider an even more basic question. Why do we even need to pray? Doesn't God already know what we need before we ask him? So why pray? It's a really, really good question. You know, I believe that prayer is something every one of us knows something about. But how many of us here are confident that we're really strong in the area of prayer? How many, by show of hands, I'm confident in my prayer life? What I find is most of us aren't. 
on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being a prayer weakling, and 10 being like a spiritual bodybuilder, what number would you give yourself in terms of your ability to pray effectively? Now, you don't have to shout it out, and you don't even have to raise your hand. But, you know, when I've done this among missionaries, you know what I get? I get fours, fives, and sixes. And so the point is, is that I think we would all agree it's an area where we need to grow. It's an area where we need to keep growing as disciples of Jesus. And what's the purpose of the church, friends? What's the main purpose of why congregations even exist? To make disciples. And I believe that there's a strong correlation between our prayer life and where we are in our maturity as disciples. I like what one congregation in the Southwest Michigan Classes has as their motto. It's, um, it's the bridge in Kalamazoo. And it's simply this. Be one, make one. I like that. Be a disciple, make a disciple. There it is. I believe it. it's really vital. Our maturity as disciples and our growth as disciples is really dependent upon our prayer lives. And this is something I believe we can all grow in. Frankly, it's a little bit like exercise. Uh, nobody is against exercise. We would all say, oh, it's very, very important. But how many of us do it? I know I'm weak at it. I don't do enough of it, and I probably don't do the right things. I think the same analogy can be made in prayer. Nobody's against prayer. But we don't necessarily how to know how to do it effectively, dynamically, in a way that makes a difference. And we can. I believe that the Lord wants every one of us to learn to pray like Jesus prayed. Like the disciples in the first century prayed. When they prayed over people that they came across that were sick, they prayed and the people were healed. And I believe that it, nothing's changed. We can pray and we can see people healed in Jesus' name. So I think it's an area we can all grow. And, and I want to challenge you. The number you give yourself, I want to challenge you with a second question by way of introduction. Where would you like to be a year from now in your prayer life? Because I believe if you, if, if you see yourself as a five, that you can move maybe to six or seven a year from now. And two years from now, Eight or nine. But it's something that where our experience gives us confidence and, and we build at it. Much like exercise and physical fitness. I use that because I know that um, some people are so physically fit and it's like, wow. But it didn't happen for them overnight. It's the same thing with our, spirit, our, our being disciples, our spiritual growth, and our prayer life. Now, every move of God, if you study any histories of revival, it always was birthed by prayer. Do you know where the, the fastest growing church has been in the last 50, 60 years? You know which nation has probably grown the fastest? Yes, I heard it. The People's Republic of China. In 1949, the communists took over. They, they threw out all of the missionaries. They arrested the pastors. They shut down the buildings of worship. And the body of Christ thought, what is going to happen to the church in China? There were less than a million believers there. But then there was a nation called South Korea right across the peninsula there. And they began to target the People's Republic of China in prayer. 
along with a lot of others around the world, praying for China. And they didn't find out until the, the late 70s and early 80s when things began to open up a little bit over there, what had happened. And do you know what had happened? Exponential growth through a house church movement. It was a spontaneous move of the Holy Spirit. Today it's estimated that out of 1.3 billion people in China, 10 to 15% of the population knows Jesus personally, has a relationship with the living God. They went from less than a million to about 150 to 200 million out of the 1.3 billion. Wow. Now there's another place you might not know about that's also experiencing exponential growth. Anybody want to guess? I'll give you a hint. It's somewhere in the Middle East. It's Iran. It's good. This is a knowledgeable group of people. Iran is just simply, there is a multiplication of disciples going on. This is a place where there's open persecution against the church. How did that get birthed? People have been praying for Iran since 1979 when the, when the Shah took over and, and, and it was an Islamic revolution. Very, very hard times for the church. And yet people are praying and Jesus is showing up in people's dreams. He's giving them dreams and visions. And whole villages are turning to the Lord. The government doesn't know what to do. It's happening in Iran. Beautiful. Again, birthed by prayer. So, I am going to follow my notes because I'm going to go off on tangents if I don't. Why do we pray? Why do we need to pray? But I, 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 I introduce this because I say, what do you want to see happen in, here in Hopkins? Do you want to see the Lord move in signs and wonders and miracles and do amazing things? You want to see the forces of darkness push back, the kingdom of God advanced? It, the Lord wants it. But it'll be birthed in prayer. Anything the Lord chooses to do that is supernatural will be birthed in prayer. That's why we've got to grow in our prayer lives. And we can. Why do we pray? If you're following in your outline, the first is the first point and fill in the blank, God's, because it's God's appointed way of obtaining what we need. See, God set it in motion from the, be, from the very beginning. He made an arrangement, and he said, you're going to be my eyes and ears on the earth, and you're going to pray to me in my name, and I'm going to go to the Father and I'm going to make sure you get what you need for your situation down there. It's like we're in a partnership. But James says you have not because you ask not. It's, it's almost like the Lord is limited by our prayerlessness. He's designed it that way. So he wants us to partner with him. And that is why the enemy works so hard to encourage us to ignore this spiritual discipline and not do it very much. I, I said nobody's against prayer. <laughs> Satan's against prayer. But no followers of Jesus would ever say, hey, that's not very important. We know it's important. We just don't know how to do it effectively and dynamically and biblically sometimes. Or we just, we give up before we see the result. Friends, Jesus says this. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. This is Luke 11, 9 through 10. For everyone who asks receives. Whoever seeks finds. And whoever knocks, the door will be opened. Prayer is like a hotline to the very throne of God. I gave you my phone, Beth, but pull out your cell phone. <laughs> okay? 
And picture this, that it's possible to dial your phone and go straight to the throne room of God. Do you believe you can do that? That's what it's like. And the good news is you're not going to get one of these. Your call is very important to us. <laughs> Please leave your name <laughs> or wait on the line for the next available person. Or, <laughs> if you need rescuing from any trouble, dial 1. <laughs> if you need resources, dial 2. If you need forgiveness, dial 3. If you need patience, dial four. You know what I'm saying. This, this is one of the hardest things coming back after 25 years on the mission field. I come back here and I can never talk to a person on the phone anymore. It's really different. But God isn't like that. Praise God he's not like that. We have a hotline. He's available 24-7, 365 days a year. He's just waiting for us to address him, to come boldly into his presence and ask what we need. Now, I want to say that, <laughs> following my notes because I'm going off, prayer is, secondly, a key way that we relate to God. This is one of the main ways that we relate to God. Think about Jesus. All the things Jesus did He's busy training those 12 disciples. He's busy ministering to the multitudes. But he always took time to pull away from ministry and even pull away from his closest disciples to do what? To spend time with his heavenly Father. And by the way, before Jesus came, nobody would refer to God as our heavenly Father. He called him Abba which in Aramaic is daddy. He had intimacy with God. He knew him as his Abba, his daddy. And he would spend time with Abba before every campaign he was ever engaged in. And just to pull away from the busyness of all of it, to spend time in his presence. Now, if Jesus did that, how much more do we need? This is how we relate to God. It's a key way that we relate to God. I want to say that sometimes we're limited by our understanding of prayer. We think that prayer is simply us talking with God, you know, like one directional. We have the need, we talk to God, that's what prayer is. But prayer is also listening it's a dialogue. Do you know, I never understood the concept of listening prayer until Beth and I were in Estonia a number of years, and an RCA volunteer gave us a little book called God Guides, written by a lady named Mary Gee, who spent 38 years on the mission field as an RCA missionary in India. And she built her whole ministry on the concept of listening prayer. So people would come to her and say, uh, Mary, my husband is beating me. This terrible thing is happening. What do I do? And she'd say, well, let's ask the Lord what you should do. And she'd, she, she, so what she did is she took authority over all the other spirits, silencing them in Jesus' name. And she said, now only, only the Lord speak to this Hindu woman and to me, and we'll get the guidance we need. And the Lord would give guidance. They would go into a time of silence for 10 to 15 minutes, and Mary would say, what did you hear the Lord say to you? This is what I heard the Lord say. And they received supernatural guidance, and it was life transforming. Many times, it led these Hindu women into a relationship with the Lord because they realized Wow, you have a God, you serve a God who speaks. And he does. Well, we read through this little booklet 
and Beth and I and our family were so impressed by it that we became practitioners of listening prayer. And you know, every major decision we made, we, we, as a family, we said, we're going to go into a time of listening prayer and ask the Lord what he thinks we should do. We actually changed fields from Estonia in 2008 to go into the Middle East and Bahrain. It was a big change. And we thought, Lord, is this you? Should we do this? Should we stay in Bahrain what should, or stay in Estonia? What should we do? We went to a time of listening prayer. And over the next four weeks, the Lord gave a very clear message to all nine of us. To Beth and to me and to our seven children. Because it involved all nine of us, we thought the Lord needs to speak to all nine of us. And we got a green light and a go with a lot of other messages that were very, very helpful for us. Now my point is, is that listening prayer is something that probably few believers are even aware of. I know... I pastored here over five years. I never taught you anything about listening prayer because I'd never heard of it. Didn't, ever, didn't take one class at seminary on prayer. Isn't that telling? We have not because we ask not. And we don't know much about it sometimes. Or we're, we stay at a kindergarten level when the Lord wants to move us on so that we can learn to pray with authority, to pray like Jesus prayed and the apostles prayed in the first century. And it's all possible because I've been around some prayer champions that pray that way. And it's like, wow, Lord, help me to become a prayer champion. I want to be a prayer champion. I want to learn to pray like and that's what it was like with Jesus. Now the third, if you're following the outline, prayer is also important for our spiritual formation. Okay? Most of the time we think of prayer as a long list of, Lord, here's what you got to do for me. This is what I need from you. Okay? But really, the Lord uses our prayers to form Jesus' character in us. It's for the purpose of our spiritual formation. There's a, there's a pastor in, in Kansas named Brian Zand. You've probably not heard of him. I hadn't. He's the author of a book called Water and Wine. And, he, and it's a very, very challenging book. It's a good book. He says, The primary purpose of prayer is not to get God to do what we think he ought to do, but for us to be properly formed. Prayer is not like a letter to Santa giving him all of our want lists. Yeah, if we're honest about it, sometimes that's what our prayer life is. It's like we're a bunch of spoiled brats saying, this is what we need, Lord. I want a bigger house. I want a better car. I want this. I want that. Honestly, the Lord wants to hear from us. I'm not saying that, but it's, it, it, it's, that's not all it is. That's what Brian is saying. He's not, it's not a Santa list. Prayer is not about advising or managing God, but being properly formed by him. And God uses the prayers we pray to form us as his disciples, to make us more like Jesus. So, in your outline, there are some prayer acronyms that I placed there because I think these can be useful to keep balance in our prayer life. ACTS. ACTS can stand for adoration or praise. Confession, admitting before God where we're weak or where we need to change or where, what we need to repent from. Thanksgiving or celebration, you know, thanking the Lord. And S is for supplication, which is a fancy word that nobody uses anymore. King James Version. <laughs> supplication just means petitioning. We're asking the Lord for the things we need. Acts. 
I already shared in February, PUSH, the acronym PRAY UNTIL SOMETHING HAPPENS. Sometimes we just need to push through until we get a clear answer. And even PRAY is a good acronym. Okay, the P can be for praise. Our prayer life should always involve celebrating who God is and praising him for his greatness. Okay, R, what do you think that is? Repent. Repentance should always be a part of our prayer life. I don't know about you, but we got to do it regularly. I know I got to do it regularly. Sometimes I, I tell new believers, memorize 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We got to camp on that sometimes. It's key to forming Jesus in us when he shows us the areas that need to change and we can repent and ask the Lord to change us and he'll transform us. It's a process. Repentance. Um, uh, a, a is for ask. Ask for what we need. And Y is for yield. Yield. Classic example. Jesus is facing the cross and he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. And what does he ask? Father, if it's at all possible, let this cup pass from me. He's dreading it. He's seeing the terrible price he's going to have to pay to do the Father's will. And he's saying, Lord, is there any other way, Father? Let this cup pass from me. Let's do plan B. But then the why, the yield. But not my will, your will be done. And that's an important part of our prayer life. Is that part, sometimes the Lord says, I'm not going to do it the way you want it. You're going to have to go through something hard and you're going to have to yield to my will. So pr let's pray like Jesus. Lord, not my desire, but your desire for me. Because you know better what I really need. So Jesus, Jesus' disciples come to him in our passage and they ask him how to pray. And Jesus gives him what we know as the Lord's Prayer. Now what's going on there? Do you think that these disciples don't know how to pray? They're Jewish. They read the Psalms. They sing the Psalms. Of course they know how to pray. You couldn't be a Jew and not know how to pray. In fact, interestingly enough, everybody knows how to pray. Prayer is not unique to Judaism or Christianity. All the different religions pray. The Buddhists pray. The Muslims pray. The Hindus pray. Even pagans pray. But who are they praying to? And what influence are they coming under? That's the question. But for followers of Jesus, prayer is just so important. It's so critical. And so what the disciples are saying is, Lord, teach us to pray the way you pray. Give us something so that we can pray as well as you do. Lord Jesus. That's what they're really asking. And so that's what he's doing. He's playing the role of a good rabbi here. Notice the question is, teach us to pray even as John taught his disciples to pray. Because good rabbis give their students prayers to pray. Do you follow? So that they can pray more effectively. That's why one of the wisest things we can do is have a series on the Lord's Prayer to see what's there. Because it's the prayer of prayers. It's the foundation for all of our other prayers. And it's really true. It's so rich. There's so much there. We can't even go into all the detail, but the point is, he's giving them what they're looking for, which is a good prayer to pray. How many of you know the Lord's Prayer? 
Oh, that's what I thought. You know we pray, we've prayed well if we pray the Lord's Prayer. Yet some of us come from traditions. That's why the next point in your outline is uh, exposing our evangelical bias. <laughs> Brian Zan points out, and I think quite accurately, that the historic churches, meaning the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Churches, the Anglican Churches, the churches that have been around a long time, They'll recite this every Sunday. They'll recite this every day in some cases. But we evangelicals have a tendency to shrink back from that. And we say, ah, oh, the Lord never intended us to pray the Lord's Prayer. He just wanted us to understand it. Is that really true? He's exposing a real bias. I know sometimes we say we shouldn't do it because... Because then it becomes so familiar that we do it mindlessly. We always got to be concerned about that for sure. But it's a good prayer. In fact, let's take a moment right now and let's pray it together. Let us pray, friends, the prayer that our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's a great prayer. It can be sung too. How many of you like that our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And I'll spare you, I won't sing the whole thing. But it is beautiful. And it is good for us. The Lord uses it to form us. Plus, we can learn from it. We, if, you, if you take the Lord's Prayer apart, there's some very, very important things there. Like, here's a good prayer. This is something you can do. You get, you, you're faced with a situation. You don't know how to pray. What do you pray? Here's a good prayer. Lord, here's our situation. I pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in this situation. I don't even know what it is. We do, I don't understand the, the best way to go on this, Lord. But your kingdom purposes be revealed. Your kingdom come, your will be done in this situation. Every day I pray, Lord, your kingdom come and your will be done in my life and in my family. Lord, your kingdom come and your will be done in my ministry. Your kingdom come and your will be done in the Reformed Church in America and the huge decision that's going to be made come June. Good prayer. Can't go wrong with that. This is an example of taking it apart and saying, that's a good way to pray. Now, oh, there's so much here I want to go into, and, and I don't have time. How are we doing time-wise? Good? <laughs> okay. I want to get to the application. Learning to pray well. Because I think that's what's going on here. The disciples are saying, Lord, teach us to pray like John taught his disciples to pray. Rabbi, teacher, show us how to pray like you pray. And he gives us what we now know as the Lord's Prayer. Application. I believe we need to follow the lead of the early church. If you go to the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 42, you get a summary statement of one of the earliest church meetings and what's going on there. And this is what it says. Acts 2.42, this is from the ESV version. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, which would be the equivalent of getting some good teaching and preaching, okay, and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, what's that? Celebration of the Lord's Supper. 
often in those days in the form of a love feast. They'd, they'd have a potluck, and then they would also remember the Lord um, through the Lord's Supper and the prayers. I want you to catch that. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread or celebration of the Lord's Supper, and to the prayers. Your NIV says, and to prayer. Bad translation on that. The, the, in the Greek, it's tais pra, praskukais. Okay, and that means plural with the definite article. Literally, it's, and they dedic- devoted themselves to the prayers. Isn't that interesting? So what, do you, what were the prayers? What were the prayers? You can be sure one of them was the Lord's Prayer. The prayer that Jesus taught us is, is the model prayer. You can also be sure that it's the same prayer book Jesus used. What was Jesus' prayer book? The Psalms. He prayed the Psalms all the time. Even when Jesus was on the cross, he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 22 and see how it opens up. And somebody want to read it? Go ahead, Ruth Ann. Just, just the first part. And it, it goes on. That's good. The point is, he cried that out. That's his prayer book. And there, there are other places that you can see he's lifting them right from the Psalms. The Psalms is their worship book. They sang and worshipped with the Psalter. And it's the prayer book. So the point is, is even though we tend to have a bias against prepackaged prayers, we can actually learn to pray the scriptures. I encourage it. If you look at some of the New Testament passages where, where Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is praying these amazing prayers for the various churches, simply take those and apply them to your situation. It's very effective. Or, if you're in a situation, for example, um, you're, you're struggling with fear, go find a passage that deals with fear. So Psalm 56 says, when, I think it's about verse 3 or 4. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, whose word I praise. In God, I trust. I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? And I'm thinking, that's a good prayer when I get afraid. And I've done that. I'm suddenly in a terrifying situation and I say, Lord, when I'm afraid, I will trust in you. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? And the Holy Spirit gives me a boldness and the fear lifts. And I'm just using it right from the Psalter. David prayed that prayer when they seized him in Gath and he thought his life might be over and he prayed that. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God whose word I praise. In God I trust, I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? And the Lord delivered him. We got to learn to pray the scriptures, friends. It's a fantastic resource. Jesus did it. And we need to learn to do it. Now, I am very challenged by the Muslim adhan, the call to prayer. You know what that is, right? You've probably heard it. Maybe you've seen a movie and you see Muslims, and we heard it every day. I mean, we lived right across the street from a mosque, and they, and they blare it into your bedroom and living room five times a day, even at night. You know, and, 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 and that prayer goes like this. 
God is great, in, in Arabic, God is great, uh, come and pray. There is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. Now, friends, three-fourths of that is right on the button. And I thought, wow, if they just get rid of the, and Muhammad is his prophet, do you know there are followers of Jesus from Muslim backgrounds that continue to use that prayer, and they just substitute, and Jesus is his Messiah. Praise God. God is great. Come and pray. There is no God but God. Like, he's the only one. And Jesus is his anointed one. Isn't that great? I think what inspires me is that if, if you're a Muslim, you're praying that five times a day. You're praying to a God that you only know fearfully from a distance. No personal relationship at all. And I'm thinking, we have a relationship with the living God as our Heavenly Father. And yet we can go days at a time without even a meaningful conversation with Him. What's wrong with us? We're not taking advantage of the great resource that we have. And I want, I want you to know something. Islam did not, that didn't originate with Islam. That, that was, that, they didn't come up with that. Do you know they, they borrowed it from a, an ancient Christian tradition? The early church, if you look at the Didache, written in 150 AD, you'll see there that there was an encouragement on the part of God's... The Didache, by the way, is just a manual written to help the church. Okay, it's not scripture, but it's just a manual. But in that manual, it says, we followers of Jesus ought to pray the Lord's Prayer three times a, a day. Sometime in the morning, then do it at noon, and then sometime in the afternoon or evening. So that we remind ourselves whose we are and how we should pray. And I'm thinking, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's pretty good. You know, later, bells were introduced. The purpose of the bells ringing were to remind the people, it's time to pray. Wow. So Islam just took that and borrowed it. And they do it better than we do on, in, in that sense. But friends, I'm challenged by that. And so you know what I did, as I said, when I took our congregation in Bahrain through the series on the Lord's Prayer, and we got to that point, I said, I've got an idea. Every time you hear the call to prayer, let's stop and let's pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. In Bahrain, in the Middle East, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And I'm thinking, it's a good reminder. You're in this oppressive environment and, and we're reminding that God is reigning above it all. And I said, I want, want you to do one other thing when you hear that. Stop and pray the Lord's Prayer and then pray this prayer. Lord, help every Muslim that's hearing this call to prayer. May the veil come off of, and may they come to see Jesus in his fullness. Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and be saved. Let's just start praying that. Now I believe that those kinds of prayers, that is the, what's going to make the difference in the Middle East. Muslims are turning to the Lord, by the way, in number. Those prayers have been reaching heaven for quite some time, and the veil is coming off. I praise God. So, growing in my own prayer life, that I, 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 my time's probably up, right? <laughs> it is my regular prayer, Lord, make me a prayer champion. I can't go around just mobilizing prayer in the RCA without being a prayer champion myself. It's like, I think that's a good prayer for all of us. Lord, help me to be more of a prayer champion. Help me to grow in this area. 
that I can be a deeper disciple. Be one, make one. Amen? Secondly, in my, my conviction is, I want to see teams of effective intercessors raised up in every RCA congregation across the country. I'd love to see that here in Hopkins. And I know there's some, there's some prayer warriors here just waiting to be mobilized. But it's like there's so many areas where we need to grow and we can grow. There's so much more to learning to pray like Jesus prayed. For instance, if, if you come across a sick person, don't just wish them well. Pray for them in the mighty name of Jesus. We can learn to pray for the sick, and we'll see the Lord raise them up. Um, how to pray, you know, there's so, many, there's so many areas. But one is how to set a foundation for devotional prayer that will actually nurture our intimacy with God. There's ways to pray where, where we pray those things faithfully. We'll, we'll go deeper in Jesus. And the Lord, Holy Spirit will use that to form more of Jesus' character in us. Um, listening prayer. How many of you have never heard a listening prayer before I just mentioned it? Okay, some of you have heard a listening prayer. Mary Gee's book is just phenomenal, and it's, a, it's inexpensive. I think every believer ought to have one. And I've got some in the car, so if you want one, you just let me know. But we can all learn to do listening prayer. It's not rocket science, friends. It's just learning a new form of prayer that's very effective for getting guidance. Big questions, small questions. The Lord wants to give us guidance. How to pray with greater authority. Sometimes, if you it, analyze your prayer, are you begging God or are you praying with boldness and authority? Hebrews 4, 16. We are actually challenged to go before the throne room of God boldly, with confidence. And he wants us to pray that way. Have you ever been around a prayer warrior that almost seems like demanding of God? And it's like, where does she get such boldness? But I believe the Lord's pleased with that kind of boldness because it's biblical. And, and, and it's because they have a deep relationship with the Lord and they know, they know God is the Abba, Daddy. I mean, think about this. Did I go to my dad and say, uh, uh, Dad, I think you're really a great guy. And uh, this is kind of my need. No, you just say, Dad, this is what I need. Can you help me? Boldly. And the Lord wants us to be bold with him. How to engage in spiritual warfare. How many of us know how to do that very well? Not many of us know how to do that. Instead, we just wait for the enemy to attack us, to put us under something. We wait for a tragedy. And it's like the Lord wants us to take authority over situations and put the enemy on the, offense, uh, on the defensive for a change. We can, we can pray, we can engage biblically, correctly, but we need to know how to do it. We need training in this area. And that's where you, you, you call upon the people that do it well. And they give you the biblical basis for it so you can learn to engage, push back the forces of darkness so that the kingdom of God can advance in this community and in this place. The Lord wants to use us to impact our communities, and it's going to happen through dynamic prayer. There's so much. What I'm looking for is to see congregations that are willing to give prayer, I mean dynamic biblical prayer, deep prayer, a try. And sort of like have Kingdom Lab go on. Kingdom Laboratory. We'll see what the Lord will do through our team of intercessors that are asking God to do these things 
in his name. Do you believe that that would make a difference in Hopkins if, if we had a, a prayer team that knew how to pray dynamically and biblically? To pray the scriptures? To do it with authority? Can you imagine what can happen? I'm telling you, programs do not change our lives. But the Holy Spirit working through his people, that's what transforms life. And the Lord wants to do it here in Hopkins. The Lord wants to do it all throughout this nation. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this amazing privilege that you've given us. That we can go directly to you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And with authority and with confidence, know that we can obtain what we really need. So Lord, in that confidence, I pray that you would raise up disciples here in Hopkins who know how to pray like Jesus prayed, who know how to pray like the apostles prayed, with authority and Holy Spirit boldness, that know how to pray through the scriptures, that know how to pray for the sick so that they're healed, to cast out demons and deliver people from spiritual bondage, to push back the forces of darkness, to advance your kingdom. Lord, we know that that is your desire. And we pray, Lord, we ask you, Lord, teach us to pray the way Jesus prayed. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.